I'm very pleased um, to welcome the two speakers for this session about editing. Um, to my right is Joel Alexis, and to her right is Maya Hawke. So if there are still people coming in, there are. I think we're, I think we're all good. Um, so Joel is uh, a very experienced editor working across both fiction and documentary, lives in Tel Aviv, if I'm not mistaken. And um, uh, we'll be talking, we'll be getting insights into her work through one particular film, but I think we're going to be talking about other, other, other work and other people you've been working with. And then to her right is Maya Hawke, who is originally a New Zealander, I think, yeah. um, and um, has been in the US for a number of years and for the last couple of years been working in London. I think that's right. So um, uh, both of them very experienced editors. I also should, should say one of the things I like about um, both of your work is that you also give back. You teach, you work in edit labs, you consult. In other words, you're, you know, you're, you're working sometimes with less experienced um, directors and filmmakers. Um, and uh, so I think some of you may be, you know, may, I don't know if any of you are familiar with the Sundance Edit Lab or uh, IDFA Summer Academy, I believe um, you've, you've been on that. Um, and I think, Joel, you also work for the Rough Cut Service, don't you? I do too. And so does mine. So both of you work for the, work for the Rough Cut Service. Um, so what I wanted to cover in this session, when I find the notes, but what, what I wanted to, to cover in this session um, was to look at um, what editing was um, and what you see editing as, and then to get some insights into... Uh, both the role of the editor, uh, how you work with directors in particular, um, and also how editing can change the idea of the film. Obviously, it's central to what a film is. So those are the elements we're going to be covering. So just to, to kick us off as a sort of word association icebreaker, um, I found a bunch of words uh, in a online thesaurus um, about what editing means. And I wanted to, um, to ask both of you uh, to maybe pick a couple of them that, closely, that were, you know, were, were closest to what you saw editing as being about. Just pick a couple of words and tell me why you, why you chosen them. So Maya, do you want to do you want to start? I go for I, I go for amplify. Um, is definitely a, a good word. I was butcher. It, it, at first glance, is kind of horrifying, but actually maybe is kind of beautiful. It's a transformation of a of a of a being into something else for a different audience, I guess. Um, a lot of the words are a little hard to take, like rectify, delete, rearrange. They're all things that you hope that you're not, that aren't the most important thing, you know, that you're not caught up in that. There's, um, there's too much of a, the idea of editing as kind of there's this block of marble and you chip away and inside there's this thing and, and that's your process. I see it as a much broader process of drawing things in from the outside and, and um, opening up channels, I work with a lot of archival material, which tends to be a sort of almost bottomless, it's not like you, someone goes out and shoots 400 hours of footage and that's it. You know, it's like, I've been involved in, a, in quite a few heavy archival projects where there is a bottomless quality to the footage, like this moon landing thing I just did, there's no end to it, you, you know, you can go on forever. And so you're, you're almost like a, when there's a lot of archival coming in at you, you and your team, and it's very much a team process, um, are, are air traffic controlling the arrival, the, the, the experience of all this footage, mm. you know, yeah. And, and so, um, it, as you say, it's not about shortening things or, or 
no. cramming material in, it's selecting. It's like. like standing in a stream and the stream is coming towards you and you're, you're fishing out things that, that, that make you feel something. Great. Yeah. Okay, um, Joel, one or two okay. words. What, uh, I like massage. If the director can make me a massage before I start <laughs> editing, I like it. Uh, I'm using a lot the word montage because it's in French and yes. this is uh, when people ask me what I'm doing, I'm using that word. Mm. Uh, but I think that I like very much analyze. Uh, it's because I like to have uh, really um, conversations about how to deal with the story and, and uh, through analyzing together with the director I think that I get to the best, the best uh, results, knowing what I'm doing, going more in depth in the in the in the themes of the film, and um, trying to understand much better how to 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 cut the film better, mainly. And, and you know, I think I don't know if, if if anybody's come to this this session expecting us to talk about you know, workflows or buttons or software or anything technical like that. Um, spoiler, spoiler alert, we're not going to. Um, I tried asking both of them in the, in the preparation, you know, what system do you work on? Is it, is it um, Premiere or Avid? And Maya said... Neither. Neither, exactly. Actually, my favourite piece of editing software right now is Instagram. Yeah, <laughs> but uh, Final Cut 10 is my software of choice for professional editing. So, but it's it's not about the buttons, is it? It's not about the uh, the technology, as you say. It's about analysing and story. Mm. Yes. I don't even sit at the controls anymore, unless I actually unless there's a special occasion. So I have my assistant. I work as a team. Um, I usually have the assistant because I, I don't like using Avid, although I did start using Avid 25 years ago. I know it very well, it hasn't changed. Um, I have the assistant set at the controls and I sit further back and we talk through everything. Everything's an analysis. We, we discuss the themes, we discuss how we feel about the material and then we make the edits together. So. Great. I, I've been waiting for the, the, uh, my assistant to come. But <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Not yet. I, I, I'm working more like uh, with a very small teams. Now I, on the project that I'm working on, I have a, um, an assistant, but I am the one who is editing and she's more assembling things and putting yep. things ready for me to, to work. So it's a, it's a wonderful uh, experience to have a, a second pair of hands uh, right. uh, helping. But, uh, I mean, I like the Avid uh, because it's like a Volvo, you know, it's not <laughs> stalling any time. So I, I, I know I'm going to get there, but it's the only thing I can say about the software. I don't know the others, so... Excellent. So, um, look, at moving, moving on from that then, I mean, the, the thing that struck me about um, uh, the work... I mean, um, Maya, you, you've uh, worked a bit on a... Um, a film called Reconstructing a Toya, which we're going to be looking at actually in the next session. As a consulting editor. Consulting editor, that's right. But you know, you don't have um, kind of your own film here at the festival. You do have, you do have Moon Landing coming up on Channel Four in July. July twentieth. Uh, around the uh, or on the anniversary, I think, of the Moon Landing. Yeah, and uh, Freedom Fields is out in, on, in cinemas right now in the UK, which is uh, the other film that I cut this year. Great, um, but I, I wanted to, to we wanted to look back for both of you at uh, just one film. So we're going to be just dealing with one film from each of you in the um, in the session, um, and we'll we'll start with with yours, Joel. Um, the the film is called In the Dark Room. Uh, tell us a bit about the main character of that. When's that film from, by the way? When was it made? It was made uh, maybe six years ago. Okay. It was the second film of a trilogy. The first is called The Champagne Spy, the yeah. second is In the Dark Room, and the third it's The Green Prince, which is more famous, uh, I think. And three of them had the main thing, theme of uh, what is family uh, life 
in the shadows of big political events. Uh, so the second film, In the Dark Room, is uh, about uh, a woman uh, called Magdalena Kopp, and she is the, uh, she's one of the wives of Carlos the Jackal. Um, meanwhile, he got married to his lawyer. I don't know if he's, they are still married, but uh, he's in jail. Uh, so Carlos the Jackal was a uh, he terrorist? Was, yes, he was a terrorist coming from Venezuela, and he became uh, famous by hijacking uh, uh, ministers in the 70s when there was a big OPEC uh, uh, summit. And he uh, was um, um, actually a terrorist for the Palestinian cause for a, a, at start. And then he became like a missionary uh, working for anybody who would give him money. A, a mercenary. Mercenary, sorry. <laughs> uh, so Magdalena Kopp uh, was a very um, beautiful young lady uh, uh, coming from Germany and she fell in love with this guy who is an alpha man and we can see in her story that she was uh, drawn to those kinds of uh, men in her life uh, and she basically um, went underground in, in a very uh, um, funny way because it was not really out of ideology, it was out of weakness, I think. Mm -hmm. And um, she became uh, a follower of the revolutionary cells. Uh, it is, the, maybe some of you know, it, it, it was a terrorist group who also hijacked um, um, uh, Air France um, plane in Entebbe. Uh, and um, s she did prison after, um, and she also tried to make a, a terrorist uh, attack in France. So, you, I mean, you're, when, you, when you had this material with her, you were um, ambivalent, to yes, say the least, much. about who she was and how you would present her as a character. Yes. Do, do you want to, should we just play the first, this, this first clip, which is that traveling shot? Or do you want to ah, set that up a little may, bit? Maybe I will set it up. Okay. Uh, because, uh, okay, so the director, uh, who is called Nadav Shirman, he made a, a very, very long interview about her, about two or three days interviewing her in a dark room, uh, because she was developing uh, photos for fake passports and so on, so that was the setting. And um, I was uh, alone watching those rushes, and the more I was watching her talk about her life in a chronological way, the less I could understand her. She seemed to me uh, someone who is, has very uh, um, few um, ideas about what she has done in life and I, I had a lot of difficulties um, identifying with her. Although she, she's doing the film and also she wrote a book to clean herself from the things she has done, I couldn't feel really um, feelings of remorse and guilt and I, was, I had really mixed feelings and I was thinking how can I edit a character that I dislike. Generally, I identify and I like the people, and with her I had really a, a tough time. Uh, and it was the time where I was watching Rushes and I was alone with the, the material because the director had a, a baby, and he was in Germany and I was in Tel Aviv, and I asked him, can I just edit things on my own just to try to connect with her? I don't know if it's going to be used in the cut, but just let me express myself in front of this woman. So this is the first, maybe the first clip. Yep. So let's just, let's just play the next clip. And so, I thought that was a really interesting clip to chosen. I'm, I'm sorry for those at the back who wouldn't, weren't able to see the subtitles, but just to explain it very briefly, um, you're seeing a, um, motorcycle, uh, sorry, car journey, motorcycle journey. Um, and uh, she's describing how when she was smaller, she was with her parents driving in Germany, um, and she was, yes, between her parents. And it's, it, it's nothing more or less than that, is it? But it's a, a memory from her childhood. 
um, then ending with the quite a sinister shot of her yes. in the dark room. W were those the, like the two sides of the character, you know, the sort of childhood, the ordinary person, and this monster, if you like, that you were trying to grapple with? Yes, I think that I wanted to connect with her because this story was part of a, a story of her parents abandoning her, basically. Mm -hmm. She had like this disease and at that time when you had this disease, I don't, know, I don't remember what it was, something with the lungs, uh, she was put away, basically. Yeah. And uh, it had to do with the whole story because she's also, she has abandoned her first daughter uh, to go underground. And I, I was really um, trying to find the mood for that uh, uh, person. And of course, this is quite dark. It was uh, when we saw this, I said, okay, I know there is no Carlos the Jackal in the story. It is not a, a good prologue for her. Uh, but I, I liked the, the, the enigma about that person. And I think that this is, uh, uh, my, it was my way to connect with this enigmatic person who is really has, uh, she has a lot of dark sides, and at the same time she is trying to understand herself, how come she became the person she, she is. Uh, and the last um, um, shot of this trial uh, was really a look into the camera. The whole um, interview was teleprompt, uh, kind of uh, Errol Morris, uh, uh, interview and even then I thought because this is like the best tool to connect with the character the ca character is looking straight at the camera so he, he, the character is looking at you the audience but I had very few moments in the in the rushes where she's really looking at me so I said I will try to take one moment and to see if we can connect with that person of course, the director saw this and, she, and he said, yeah, it's nice, but it's not really what I'm looking for. I'm mm -hmm. trying something uh, with a l more suspense. And I said, yes, okay, but I think that it's important for the editor to have some time mm -hmm. to be able to play with the material, even if it's not going to be anything in the end. Although one, the idea of the look in the camera uh, stayed, we will see it later in the real beginning of the film. Uh, but um, it has become something else. So, thank you, Joel. So, the, the, um, the series that you worked on, uh, Maya, before the moon landing was um, uh, a film about another, I probably have to say, uh, ambivalent character, but to many... I think um, we can agree he's bad. <laughs> yeah, um, a bad character, which is Bashir al-Assad, and... Uh, the um, challenge, you, you, you mentioned before that it's uh, principally archive, isn't it? Yes, um, so it has interviews as well, that the, one. Yeah. yeah. And you, you worked on that in, in quite an interesting way, didn't you, where you were um, uh, you know, left with the material to try and shape it and, again, as, as Joel was saying, work on ideas and, and try things out. Um, I mean, for those who haven't seen the series, it's a series of three films. You edited the third of them. What, what period of, of Assad's life does that cover? So m part three of um, House of Assad starts in 2011, so it cover until the present, so it covers the war. Right. Yeah. I'm sorry, and this was a series shown um, just a few months ago on BBC Two. That's right, yeah. So uh, this first clip is not... is. Um, uh, from sort of later in the film, isn't it? But it's something... Oh, is this the dream sequence? Yes. Are oh, we going to show the dream sequence, sequence first? We're okay. going to show the dream sequence first. <laughs> okay. Um, shall we show it first and then <laughs> say how it came about? Yeah, <laughs> I mean, it, it so kind of maybe it really needs it. a slight setup, maybe. Go, go ahead. In the Bashar al Assad, is a, it's like 2015, it's sort of late in the... In the in part three, and um, he's at a crossroads, the war's not, looking, not going too well for him, and so he... I created this dream sequence early one morning. Um, you know, it's a little loose and crazy, but it's it has a it it it, it is it depicts a turning point where Bashar looks to a, he looks to a ghost for for guidance. So, okay, so let's play it. It's um, it's about three and a half um, minutes long. So play the next clip, please.
because this is um, this was a uh, sort of test sequence for you, you've just filmed that with your phone on the um, in the edit room, have you, on the Abbey? I do that a lot. And so it's sorry, is my mic actually on? I think it is. Um, yeah. But so uh, the quality is obviously not the quality of the finished film. It's it's also, you know, watermarked. It's like very rough, you know, and yeah. I do do shoot a lot of videos in the cutting room. And again, just to explain for people who couldn't see the uh, very, very rough subtitles on it, um, uh, that was uh, Bashir al-Assad's father who was talking to a, uh, a Syrian astronaut. I don't even in know. In the Russian space was. program. Exactly. In the Russian space program back in the day. Yeah. And... Uh, Tell and me, so he, when, when it's like he hears history. the voice from his dead father talking to Commander Muhammad about their country. And it's at this point, with, you know, what this really is is the introduction of Putin into the story and the Russian air, air, air strikes then begin. Um, so it's, a, it's, a, um, it's using a, quite an arty technique. And you know, ultimately, this didn't end up in the series. This got killed. You know, d my boss loved it, but he's like, we can't. Let's not do this. It's too much like a feature doc. It's too, it's not the right style. And so that was a really interesting. Mm -hmm. He and I went back and forth on, you know, what, what, is, what is television and what's a feature doc and what, what, what are we trying to make here? And he wanted to, me to bring that sensibility up to a point. You know, it can't be this sort of Herzogian dream sequence. Because you've, that's right, you've uh, mentioning somebody who's also at the, at the festival, Werner Herzog. You, um, have edited uh, I quite cut a two, number of films. two films with him, and I assisted on eight films with him, and my husband cut 27 films with him in our house. So, yeah, and, big influence. Uh, and I think you, 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 you said to me that, um, because the producer you're, you're mentioning is uh, David, uh, no, or the executive producer is David Glover of, of that Assad series, yeah. who runs a company called 72 Films, former Channel 4, um, uh, head of Specialist Factual, commissioning editor. Um, uh, and you, you said to me that, you know, he, he wanted you to be epic and Herzogian in the film, but he saw his job as to sort of rein you back yeah. as an editor. Yeah, like I, I think David, you know, he's a close friend of mine and I, I have such admiration for him. I love working with him. We've done two shows together now. And um, he sees me as, I, I, as a sort of slightly, out, slightly chaotic force of, like, I do sort of a lot of ex experimental stuff where I just try stuff out, like, you know, here's footage of Bashar getting in a fighter jet, like, what, what does that look like with some music? And, you know, it, it, I, it, my, my process is much more, like, not arriving in the edit and doing the paper cut and then filling in the b-roll it's more like let's look at the archival footage see what amazing moments there are and then try and build scenes around that and then fit, fit the information that we need into the film and so you know um, Glover and I kind of balance each other out in a nice way you know his 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 role is to bring it he he, he understands television he understands how to bring this to the biggest audience possible whereas my work is doesn't really think about the audience as it's not that accessible to the audience, it's not accessible enough to the audience. And that's why I've been working in British television was um, to, 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 to see what it's like to, to play to that kind of audience, you know, and what that takes for an editor. Great. Listen, I, I want to um, make sure we, we crack on so that we do take some questions because I yeah. want to explore this a bit more. Let's now look at the beginning of, of the into the in the dark room film, um, which is the very beginning of the film, and sets up the story. For, um, I, I love this opening because I think it, it does, through the choice of images, really draw you into um, the, the whole idea of the film, um, of this dark place that uh, Magdalena Kopp is, is inhabiting. Um, so, is there anything else to, to say to set it up? Um, maybe it's, uh, it's interesting just to say that um, the film in the dark room is about Magdalena, but it is also about Carlos. Yes. Basically, when we approach uh, broadcasters, they are not really interested in Magdalena, but they are interested in Carlos. 
And Carlos is not in the film because he's in prison and he didn't want to make an interview with us. So it is also trying to put someone in the picture when he's not in the picture. Right. Okay, so let's play the next clip. But I thought what I, I really liked that sequence because I thought, um, uh, you know, in a, in a very real way, it developed over the time, over the, those first three minutes, and you really get, you're in the world of the, of the photographic darkroom, which is telling the story of how the two of them came to, to meet. Um, and, uh, yeah, when, when you were editing that, and going back to that first word you chose at the beginning of the session, analyzing, um, uh, was it always obvious that the film was going to start as a sort of photographic, you know, in a, in a photographic place? Uh, no, I think that... Uh, um, Try and speak a little further up. I my computer? Okay. All right. I think that um, the way we, we worked on that film and on the, the trilogy is that I had a very... Uh, very detailed script and then when I look at the footage there is nothing com uh, that I can do with the script and the footage so the script is for found, uh, foundations and for uh, broadcasters and then not for the editor <laughs> somehow <laughs> which is something that I like because then it says okay now we can start all over the reality is that we have shots like this we have shots like that we have archival and the archival, when you are working with archival, it, it's not that you have it all on your computer in the start. You mm -hmm. are all the time adding things. So all the time it is changing yes. what mm -hmm. to put. And we were, we were waiting for uh, pieces about Carlos, maybe to start with Carlos, when he was kidnapping the ministers with his Che Guevara hat. And that is the most uh, uh, famous image of him and maybe we had all kinds of um, ideas to how to start the film, but I think that uh, we chose this one because it gives a lot of uh, somehow mystery of things to come. Yes. And because she's a woman who is hiding a lot and she's uh, um, talking very slowly and very carefully because she has like five lawyers behind the door watching everything she says because some of the things she cannot say. He is still alive and maybe he is still dangerous and her life is in danger as well. So she was really, really careful about how she was telling her story and we were always trying to, to bring it to life somehow with the editing. Uh, um, I mean, the dark room, it was quite obvious. It's all happening in a dark room. She is a photographer, she is uh, forging passports, she has been active as a terrorist in that room, yeah. not that room, but in, in that atmosphere. And uh, for us it was uh, um, actually a nice way to set up all the, the political uh, aspect of the story and also um, a sense of danger, a sense of uh, um, underground uh, ambience and uh, th those are the things we were looking for. Great, okay. I mean, then I wanted to move Maya to the beginning of the beginning of the of your Assad film, which then also became the title sequence for all three films mm -hmm. in the series. Um, uh, and it was, I mean, for those in the feature documentary world, perhaps you know, title sequences and long pre-titles and things with, you know, front credits is, is normal. In television, not so normal. Yeah. Um, uh, so, again, we're going to see a couple of, uh, we're going to see a, some very rough pictures which you then shot from the edit monitor. Yeah. Um, but just, just tell us briefly um, uh, what was the, what was the idea that you had to start as a title sequence? What, what was sure. the mood you So thought? I didn't know that people didn't have title sequences per se in, feature, in British TV. So I didn't really, wasn't really aware of that. I, I just thought we were making a series. So I thought, well, there, 
we need to, you know, in, in the same way that the title sequence for The Sopranos or something kind of captures um, a, a, a feeling of, um, and, you know, of the, of the enormity of the, of the story. And I, so I just wanted to do that. And at the, at the time we were, we, were, we were going through the footage and Ella Wright, who was my producer on the show, was the first time I'd ever had a producer in the room, an edit producer in the room with me. And um, she was just, and I was, I thought that was kind of a creepy idea. I didn't really like it. But once, as soon as I met her, she was great. And she knew all about the story and she knew the footage and she was just brilliant. Um, and so Ella and I together started putting pictures on the wall of what we thought the main characters were. Even though Bashar al-Assad and Asma al-Assad were the main characters per se, the, the characters of our episode were this doctor, they were this guy from the security forces, uh, the people that we thought were fascinating from the interviews that, that were present in, in the world that we were working with. Um, and so again, early one morning, which is when I usually edit by myself, um, I had also been collecting images in Evernote on my laptop because the computers at the farm where we edit in Soho are not connected to the internet, which I find mind-bending. Um, just because I, like you, you, you're constantly bringing in more stuff. And so I'm finding images on the internet and printing them up, putting them on the wall. And so then I just opened my laptop and opened Final Cut and imported all these images that I'd that I'd found and made a title sequence. And so that's what you're going to see is the, is the, they're just still images. It's just an idea. But there's certain motifs in there that I thought were very strong. And one of them you'll watch out for is a pair of uh, Christian Louboutin shoes, which have blood red soles. And Asma al-Assad is known for buying those shoes in great quantities and being friends with that shoe designer. And it's, kind of, it's not in the series, but it, it, if you get it, they're, they're, it's like she's walking in, in pools of blood. So it, on the one hand, it's quite, it's quite a glamorous title sequence, but it's also very dark. Um, and it, it's set against the backdrop of, of well, you'll see, the, the war. So we'll, we'll see that first sketch first, and then straight afterwards, we'll then see um, what the title sequence became, although, again, it's not the yeah. finished, polished, graded. It's yeah, and I, to be honest with you, I don't even know what the final title sequence looks like because I haven't seen it. So let's play those, let's play those yeah. two uh, back to back then. There you go, that's... Look, you see the editing. <laughs> there we go, the, ins the inside of Maya's, uh, of Maya's cutting room. So look, I think what I, what I want to do, there are a few other things to cover, but I would really like to take questions from the floor and maybe we could cover some of that and the answers. So there are a couple of volunteers in the orange with microphones. If somebody's got a question, um, uh, or a reflection on what you've heard or what your experience of editing is even, um, please uh, shout up. I, can I see any questions? I can see somebody first with a hand up in the middle there. And Hi. Um, there you go. So, can you hear me? Yeah. Is that Mike? Mike. Uh, D I feel I'm I'm I mean, yo, okay. that's Hi. me. Hi, everyone. <laughs> uh, thank you so much. Um, obviously, music's a big part of what you guys do. Um, and I just wondered, sort of, when you were starting out, do you guys have a musical background? Did you work with musicians early on in your careers? Obviously, now you're much more established. You have musicians on board and, and people who write scores. I was wondering how you kind of developed your editing in line with your musical inclinations, as it were. You first? <laughs> yes. Um, I have... Um, I am collecting music all year around things that I hear on the radio, but also things that people send me. They know that I am looking for music. I'm using this as temp. Uh, I, I feel I need to put the music, then I take, many times I take it out, of course not for an opening uh, of this sort where it was needed, but I feel that the music helps me to, have, to keep a beat, to keep a rhythm, and, um, and also, I think that if it's not uh, um, um, spoiling the, the story, uh, I think it's a, it's a nice way of putting, setting a mood that it helps really to, if you want to, to have an obscure uh, uh, atmosphere, then the music really helps you, or attention. Um, I, I work with that a lot, and then, of course, we have to change everything because uh, someone is really 
because um, of the cost of the music. Yeah. Yes, of clearing. We cannot pay this. Mm. Yeah. And, and Maya, you, um, you you also work with music and sound design. I mean, I, I don't know if sound design is also part of your yeah. Your I question. mean, compelling too. Yeah. Yeah, totally. Um, I mean, I, I don't come from a musical background. I'm not musical, which is. But then I will also say I'm sort of when I when I work I'm sort of like a. It's like my mother was a dancer, and I, I'm like her. It's like when you hit the space bar and the music plays, then you can begin. And so music is such a beautiful part of being an editor. It's such an important part of being an editor, just because it's your, your friend in the editing room. And um, you know, you, any, day, any day, if you're not, whatever you're feeling when you come into the room, you hit the space bar and the music plays and you begin editing. So that, it's like ballet class for me. Um, I work with a composer, in uh, the United States. I've worked with him for about uh, 10 years now, mostly on my own projects. I love working with him. That's Mark Delantoni. Um, but I have worked with a couple of composers here in the UK. Um, they, they, it was great, you know, totally fine. Um, it's... Uh, yeah, I, I... Sorry, I'm a bit difficult to say right now. No, sure. Yeah. I mean, it's Music's a difficult thing because people, you know, they're, they're, sometimes it gets used to, um, for example, in this moon landing series I just did, it sort of got used to add an element which I didn't particularly like. It was all about this kind of, you know, this kind of, I don't know what, what to call it. Overdramatic. Overdramatic, yeah. And when I was working with the composer, we weren't doing that kind of thing. And then later on, things changed. And music was used as a kind of cudgel to, to, to make, make it a certain way, which I didn't really like. OK, I can see Thank you. one question there. And then there's one right at the back, um, if you can. So who, who's, who's got the microphone now? Ah, sorry, I meant the, the person who, had to, who was there with his Hi there. Hello, 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 hello. Yes. Uh, I just wanted to ask about uh, having the director in the cutting room. What's your preference? When do you want them there and when do you not? Well, yeah. Go on. Okay, so the last job I did, we didn't have a director. Um, we just kind of cut out that role altogether, which is sort of interesting. Um, I, that was the moon landing live that I did. Um, with Assad, the director was not in the cutting room with me. Um, he had his, he worked on episode one, um, but in that case, when you already have an executive producer and you have a producer in the room with you and you have, you're already, you know, there's, there's a, already a filmmaking team in place and the interviews were done by some of the, by the producers, um, so also by the director. And so it was less, uh, it wasn't a very director centric process. The, you know, David Glover is a very, powerful force and in a way he was kind of a director on the show, um, I was kind of a director on the show. Like I think there's, there's a sort of interesting, we're, we're experimenting with breaking down that sort of auteur director centric paradigm a little bit and that's how I've worked in the last few years. Yeah. Great. But, now there was a question right at the back, there you go, and then, uh, and then the person down here and that might be our lot. Hi, uh, um, Maya, I was just wondering, and I'm not sure if I heard you right, but did you say that you haven't seen the final uh, That's sequence? That's correct. And is there a story behind that? Sure. I mean, I, you know, I, I'm, I, the way I've been working with 72 films is they, they bring me on to do a first cut, and, you know, which is 10 weeks or whatever. Um, and then, because I'm not, so experienced with television, I work in tandem with an editor named Sam Santana, who's a marvelous, magical editor and my, my partner in, in all of this. And he is much more experienced with working with the commissioning editors and going through the kind of process that has to be gone through, which I don't really have the temperament for. Um, and I didn't see the Assad series. I, I moved on to another project. I was away when we premiered it. Um, you know, I, I've heard it's great. I, I did look at one scene, and it was a very important scene to me. It was a chemical weapon scene that I cut, and um, I, I was really, it was sort of the most important scene to me of the whole series, where 
on the news every night we're seeing chemical weapons attacks or the war depicted in Syria and people are just deaf to it. They're just not seeing it. It's like you can show dead bodies all you like and nobody seems to, nothing changes. And so I really wanted to do something different with this incredibly traumatic imagery. And so I cut a chemical weapon scene. I did it in one pass one morning, again, early morning cutting, uh, which is what the advisors who were helping us deal with the traumatic imagery advised us to do, which is to, to work on things at the beginning of the day when it's that disturbing. Um, and I made a cut that, that, was, that was an emergency room in the middle of a chemical weapons attack. And it was, it was very, it was like sort of something you hadn't really seen before. And when I glanced back to see what they'd done with that scene, they'd inserted a picture of a room full of dead children. And I, I, that's not what I would have done. And so I didn't really want to, I, I, I haven't yet engaged with the rest of the show. Yeah, I know episode one and episode two are great. You know, they're, those, they're, they're really well done. And I, I hear not much has changed in episode three, but I'm, I'm a little, I'm not very good at looking back at my own work. It's kind of a failing of mine. Yeah. <laughs> okay, we'll just take a last question from the gentleman there. Uh, we can stand up. Um, thank you. Um, just one question, really. When you're taking on a project, um, let's say it's with a, a, a new director, it's a, it's a new commission, what, what, goes, you know, what, what is your, your, your process of choosing and selecting what you take and what you don't? Would it be meeting a director, the relationship there? Would it be the project itself, the content of what you might be cutting? Or could it be the freedom you're given or not given to edit the way you want? Yeah. Joe, yes. jo, why didn't you yes. answer that one? Uh, when I was young, I was choosing the project, and then I had a quite difficult experiences with some directors that I was not getting along, so now I am choosing the people more than the film, because it is my life, you know, <laughs> and it's months of, of uh, coexistence in a small room, uh, generally, so I need to like the person, I need to feel comfortable with the, that person, and I feel that, for me, this is the best uh, um, uh, it, it, is, it is an important decision. Of course, I will not work with somebody I like that has a, a, a bad project. I mean, I'm not uh, crazy, but I have, to, I, I have to take care of myself, and I'm really uh, uh, trying to, to feel my radars if this person is the right person for me to, to go along on a long journey like that. So that's really important for me. Mm. Great. Well, Can I answer that one yeah, as sure. well? I just want to say, I, I feel the, at the moment I'm choosing projects based on what a woman editor can do, should do, should be doing. Like, I, there's so, women editors are, are underrepresented in certain areas, or all over, and in television in particular. And so I've been choosing masculine projects, like Syria. You know, I chose that over a film about a missing little girl for Netflix, and it's like, no, I'm gonna do the war, or I'm gonna do a, a feature doc for ESPN next, because I really feel like it's important to, um, for us to be represented, yeah. Great, okay, excellent, um, excellent way to end it. Thank you very much. Can we have a big round of applause for Maya and Gerard?